Hey everyone, and welcome to Shaper Sessions. I'm Jake. And I'm Russ here at Shaper Headquarters in San Francisco. And today we are very happy to present a project that I've been working on for the past month and a half, uh, the lounge chair. Oh man, and it's beautiful. <laughs> we can't wait to show it to you guys. We're going to cover from start to finish Jake's entire build process. We're going to walk over there. We've got the chair stowed away in the corner of the workshop. Uh, give you a little tour of some of the features of the chair now that it's built. I think this is the big reveal. And uh, you may have seen this along the way on Instagram through the build process. So this is our total wrap up of this project. Uh, and then we're going to cut a couple of parts. We've got a really interesting part that we've never done before. And we're going to show you how to do it. Yeah. And on top of that, we also want to uh, ask you in the comments. So as, as usual, we have the question in the comments in order to get in for our giveaway at the end of the show. Uh, and the question is... Where do you buy your router bits? Where do you buy your router bits? Now, why are we asking that today, we, Jake? We might have some, uh, some reason behind that. Uh, we're excited to release three new bits on the store, and we are going to give away one of each of those new bits at the end of the show today. Mm -hmm. And what do we got? We have a one-inch long, quarter-inch diameter, long-reach, flat-end router bit, so very similar to our stock router bit, just with a little extra length for some longer tenants. Yep. We have a three-quarter inch uh, long by one-quarter inch diameter ball nose router bit. So that's a full round on the end. Uh, let's show these to folks also while we're talking about them. And I've got the project that we've used this specific router bit for. Yeah, we'll do the origin cam, I believe. That's probably going to be the best. Yeah. So just to show a little bit extra length on that one-inch long cutting flute. Mm -hmm. but you Beautiful. Can see it looks very similar to to our standard bit, we have the ball nose. So this is gonna be used in projects like the snowman dish. So you can see mm -hmm. that, uh, I guess it's a 1 8 radius. Mm -hmm. And that's how you and get those really I'm gonna pop really in with the snowman dish here. Inter uh, internal radiuses. It's also how you do the cord channel in the elite lamp, mm -hmm. which, is what, which is our shaper, uh, shaper hub project. Mm -hmm. and, and then last but not least, we have the 11 degree tapered ball nose router bit what I call the unicorn horn. Ha! And this one's special. We use this one all the time, but it's a very special purpose tool. Um, one of its many uses is to cut the wedges, uh, both negative and positive, for these wedged tenons, as we did on the trestle bench, uh, which y'all may have seen, and on many, many more yeah. projects. Yeah, it's one of those really cool bits to have in your toolbox. Show this on the origin cam here as well. Being able to make both positive and negative of the wedge with origin is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And have it just fit just right. The other one we used that for was for the Phil Morley T Rack. We didn't use the 11 degree tapered ball end for yeah. that, but you could. You absolutely uh, could. In Phil's instructional video, he actually had a really cool way of making those features with the bandsaw that we actually practiced when we made our T Racks. But you could use this 11 degree tapered ball nose end mill for that or router bit for that as well. Absolutely. So make sure to answer the question that pops up at the bottom of the screen. Where do you buy your router bits? Uh, enter your name so that we can keep track of who's who. And we'll do giveaways at the end of the show, one of each. That's exciting. All right. Should we just take a little field trip over to the chair? Let's take a field trip okay. over to the chair. This is exciting. I don't think we've done this before. So I have the steady cam over here with a special uh, cell phone with some software on it. Goose, are we running? Okay, there we go. You can see the studio. Quick tour of the shop here. Over to Jake's favorite corner. Yeah, this is Jake's workbench on the right here. Pardon, pardon the mess. And yeah. there, there it is. Beautiful. Why don't you pop a squat in no, there? Have a quick. seat. It's a throne. It is enormous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thrown, uh, I mean, grandiose, not uh, too big by any means. Although we have a picture that we can show you all later of our friends Sean and Richie sharing the seat. So yeah. it is on the bigger side. A couple things we want to point out now that it's in its final form. A um, couple different types of joinery throughout. We have giant mortise and tenons connecting all the major parts here. We have a double lap joint. So equal sections taken out of both the arm and the front leg here and here. 
Um, all done with Origin, all really dialing in that fit, um, using offsets and, and whatnot, and getting the depths just right. We have the curved stretchers, of course, which we're going to go over a little bit more in detail um, in today's show. And because it's such kind of a funky shaped chair, we needed some sort of internal uh, internal stretcher to wrap the cord around. I call these the stretchers squared. Stretchers squared, exactly. So it's just enough room for me to squeeze the Danish cord in between the actual frame of the chair and the internal frame. Right, because you don't want to have to wrap that Danish cord all the way around this big chunky profile, right? Totally. And if you, if it will just spin around to give you an idea of what the back side looks like. Danish cord is a labor of love. Let me just say that right now. Everything in here is hand nailed um, and looped around, woven through, looped around, ten tensioned up. I spent the past couple evenings making sure this was done for today. Yeah, what's your estimate on uh, the time it took to weave this chair, Jake? If I were to sit down and do it all at once, probably somewhere around 20 hours, 10 hours per per side. So I made sure to just pull a couple of late evenings or come in on the weekend because it's also very therapeutic <laughs> yeah. to, to weave. Very zen, meditative. Super fun process. I'm, I'm really happy with it. It has just enough give. Um, and what's also fun is even though this has that front curved section, because there's so much tension that comes throughout, it starts to flatten out and almost create like a, a domed shape this way as well. Like a pillow, I think. Yeah. Even. It's very three-dimensional. Yeah. And it works. It, it's comfy. I think so. We finally made it. We've made a comfortable chair. Yeah. So this is what's new. Um, we've made a lot of chairs before here at Shaper headquarters. Um, the two big things that are new for this one are the Danish cord upholstery, which gives it a little bit of give. And then the thing that we're going to show you today, I don't think that I got a direct head-on shot of this yet, is this curved stretcher. And now when you do plywood furniture, like we've done a lot of here, you get a lot of really straight lines. And those straight lines are not comfortable for the backs of your knees or the backs of your legs. So Jake and I were talking about this one. We decided to take it an extra step here and put a curve in that front profile. We also did the same thing. Jake did the same thing. He did all the work on this. Hey, you push for it. We did the same thing on the back, and that gives just a little bit extra room, a little bit extra ergonomics for the back of your legs and your back, and you would not believe how much more comfortable this chair is than anything else that we've built before. Yeah, it's really that was, incredible. That was definitely a good call. All right, we're going to take you all back to the studio. All right. We've got a little slideshow. You might be wondering, man, that is a heck of a project. I haven't been following along on Instagram. How did you even make all that? And we're going to breeze through it. This is like a month and a half of work in five minutes or less. Yeah. And after this, if you do want to see a little bit more, you can go back on our Instagram and check out anything that says chair update in yeah. the description title. Uh, I did it every Tuesday. We had mm -hmm. some, some sort of neat tidbit in the whole process. Mm -hmm. You um, can find those on our grid and on IG Live, I think, recaptures yes. that. You find that under the IG Live tab. Yeah. But let's so, hop over to the, uh, to the slides. Yeah. Goose, if you have them. All right. So I guess it all started with a sketch. Mm -hmm. um, the whole point of this is like I, I, I really couldn't get away from this um, this front triangle, this like elongated triangle shape, and I wanted to run with that. And I have the affliction of where once I get an idea in my head, I can't really come up with a n <laughs> too many others <laughs> until someone tells me to move on. And I was just I loved this, so I had to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so from there, we had to figure out some exact. You know how this thing would sit. We had yeah. a couple of different people sit in a mock-up to figure Proportions. out proportions, the seat depth, the width, the seat angle, and the back angle. You can tell on this one the seat is a little higher, I think, than yeah. the the seat on the final chair turned out. Yeah, this is before we took about an inch or or maybe more, even more, maybe even more off of the front legs. And it's important when you're going to spend a month and a half on something, do a little preparation, just a little bit of extra preparation up front with 
just uh, slapping some MDF or plywood together will really help you dial that yeah. so that you don't waste a month and a half. Totally, totally. Um, I also now have a couple people here at Shaper asking for chairs that have blinders on the sides of them because people really <laughs> like this. Mm. Uh, all right, next one. So then we start going into the oak, um, working with an inch and a half thick white oak throughout mm-hmm. the whole chair. Thick. It's thick. So although I probably I could have cut through that with Origin, trying to make the most out of my time. So what we're doing is a hybrid cutting operation, doing all the important bits with Origin. So those are the front legs right there, and we're cutting the mm-hmm. lap joint and then the outer perimeter just down to a quarter inch to a final offset, buzz that off with the bandsaw or a jigsaw, mm-hmm. and take it to the trim router. Exactly. So I got real comfortable with our router table for this project. <laughs> Which is good, because yeah. you're probably the only one here who's fully comfortable with it at this point. I'm still scared of that router table. Every time I train someone in the shop, I like, I'm like i hesitant around that tool, because I think it could be one of the most dangerous t- tools in the shop, just because can, things can change on you really quickly mm-hmm. with it grain direction and whatnot. So I have a couple of tips there. Uh, go back to the slides. Second setup, doing the arms. I tried to nest things together as much as I could to reduce my waste. And next one. Now, on my shorter pieces, where I was also trying to reduce my waste, I nested them together. And I actually used a double workstation setup uh, in order to get a field of tape that was at an inch and a half high. Alternatives to this, uh, if you don't have two workstations around, you can create a tape board by stacking some material up or just having some extra inch and a half thick material to put out in front of you and out in mm-hmm. front of the piece that you're cutting. Um, as long as those two things don't move uh, in relationship to each other, that's, yeah. that's going to work just fine. And we've covered that a couple times. We're not going to talk about that in depth today, but if you want to learn more about that, check out our Origin Pro Tips session that we recorded a, about a month ago yeah. at this point. We've got that and more. Tape boards are really cool. or you know, I always like to keep some stock around that I can stack up to get the right mm-hmm. thickness of material. Very handy. So from there, again, just buzz that off. I also was able to do some of the joinery using this setup. But again, a tape board would, would have worked just fine. Mm-hmm. And these are the back pieces that we're looking at, right? Yeah, Those that was were the, back. the back. So we head over to the router table. I have just about a quarter of an inch to an eighth of an inch of material that I need to take up to get to my final line. And the trick here, since I had a, you know wildly differing grain directions throughout the, each piece, is a double bearinged router bit. Mm-hmm. It had a bearing on the top and the bottom, and it was a straight flute. That worked okay for me. Um, Helical flukes are great too, but most importantly, the top and bottom bearing. So instead of going uphill against grain and risking a potential kickback or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Or tear out that just doesn't even look good. Yeah. Regardless of safety. Especially with oak, it seems like it wants to just like, things are all fine and dandy and then just yeah, You're missing a little, half of your chair. A little flaky. Yeah. yeah. Um, so being able to flip things around and go with the grain direction was key, crucial. And I didn't have any kicks. Nice. Nice and smooth. All right. Another thing on tenons. Originally, I had this designed out with just giant tenons that were solid all the way through. Um, and I thought twice about it and decided to go with the rule of thirds and also split it up into two tenons instead of just one big one. This or, is like the rule of two-thirds. Rule of two-thirds, there you go. Um, <laughs> it just gave me a little bit more glute surface. It felt like a better idea, and it also is kind of fun because it, you know, how else? It's not as easy to do a double tenon by hand, and so it really highlights Origins capabilities, I yeah. think. Yeah, even if no one's going to see it now that the chair's together, you know you did it. Oh, I know it's there. <laughs> And the workstation came in absolutely clutch for this entire build. Being able to flush up the top of that back leg and cut that mortise. I Again, I'm not really sure how else I would have done this. And keep everything totally square and straight. Have it come together in plane and 
Mm -hmm. It was just a workstation was an absolute treat. So you didn't even make a fixture for that. I didn't make a fixture. I thought about it um, you know, in the past for parts like that we have. Mm -hmm. Noah's uh, mid-century chair is the big one that I think we've shown on sessions a couple of times. Yeah, and I think the difference there is his um, part where you're actually putting the mortise is is shorter. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have as much space to actually press up against the uh, support bar to reference square. Okay, and I you felt a, like you did. Yeah, I had a big old long section that I could at least press firmly up against and you know make sure I wasn't twisted in any way. Yeah. So I felt comfortable there, and I was only making one of them. There you go. If I was doing like a production run, absolutely would make a fixture. Mm -hmm. even, a, if it, even if I was making a small, a small production. Okay. Fixtures Fair. of the way. Two or three. Yeah. Make a fixture at that point. Yeah. Clamps for days. Uh, slight bit of an oversight. <laughs> <laughs> what? How do you clamp it? How do you clamp it? How do you keep this flat? Yeah. It wants to pull itself in every direction. Um, I bet, especially with those lap joints. But the, the lap joints were surprisingly the easiest part. It was the back that was so tricky. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but it all worked out in the end, especially once I put that kind of uh, auxiliary clamp from the back foot into the elbow crease. Mm -hmm. That pulled everything together nicely. Mm -hmm. that, okay. was, that was kind of a Hail Mary moment. Um, but it all worked out. Came out super clean. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't have a whole lot of cleanup afterward because I used the uh, wet bristle brush technique. From Phil from phil i love that one i can't get enough of the wet bristle brush it takes <laughs> it's, the glue off like nothing else it's like i feel like i was raised to wait until it got to attack glue got to a tacky ish point and then it scrapes right off mm -hmm. depends on the application though if you have a lot of nooks and crannies the wet bristle book wet bristle brush mm -hmm. i trademark that phil's gonna trademark that yeah um really gets rid of glue and like yeah in a really nice way. The way that I've always practiced is if you have uh, a workpiece with tight corners like that, pre-finish the areas with the tight corners or tape that them too. off. But that's just a massive amount of work. You either have to tape off your finish or you have to tape off all the glue lines. And if you j can just get in there with this wet brush, it takes it all right out. It's incredible. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. So went, went went with that technique and super happy about it. Then we did the total glue up. Quick note on this, um, and I'm going to fix it in V2, but because we have a f essentially a frame for the seat in the back, we have a frame inside of a frame, so it's kind of restrictive, right? Mm -hmm. the, the dimension of my internal stretchers, or stretcher, stretcher squared, as you call mm -hmm. them, really dictated where my tenons were going to go into the side of the chair. Mm -hmm. That's a little dicey when it comes down to it, like we were talking we were starting to measure in the 30 seconds and anytime i get mm -hmm. into that territory i and i'm not using origin mm -hmm. I'm just, <laughs> i i, I want to figure out some sort of tolerance break yeah, um so absolutely russ had the great idea for v2 we are going to create slotted slightly slotted mortises on the back of the seat and bottom of the back mm -hmm. so in case your stretcher squared are varying in dimensions mm -hmm you can compensate for it. So kind of yeah. similar to how the domino gives you a small, medium, and wide right. setting. A floating tenon, a exactly floating tenon. like a domino. Uh, yeah. In engineering land, we would call this chair over-constrained. Uh, Jake hit it right on the nose, fortunately, but if that stretcher squared was just a little bit on the long side, those tenons, the, the tenons of the original stretchers wouldn't fit into the mortises yeah. on the back of the chair. And it still led to small gaps where there could be none. Mm -hmm. So... V2 is going to have a little bit of uh, a little bit of thought in that. All right, so we started putting finish on it. Of course, you're finishing it before you do any of the recording or re weaving. Um, we did three coats of Osmo, my mm -hmm. favorite. And now the fun but painstaking task of laying out the nail pattern, nail it, uh, laying out, pre-drilling, and nailing L nails, which are oh, the. Buddy go-to thing for danish cord weaving um, how many nails are in this chair over 200 right i, I remember you saying you had to have our buddy sean pick you up a second box of yeah. 200 nails because you ran out of the first box. i think it was 250 
that is a lot of nails. Two fifty, yeah. That's two fifty. That's two hundred and fifty loops. That's two hundred and fifty like weaving steps, yeah. approximately. Yeah, it's a lot of weaving. Um, got really handy with a tack hammer. Uh, absolutely recommend getting a tack hammer for this job because a normal hammer is just going to be a little too big for you, a little too big to get into those spacings. Um, and each nail on the weft side is spaced out to be an uh, three eighths of an inch apart. Three eighths apart. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. That dictates the spacing on your overall cording, though, which is something that I learned. Um, I had built a chair a couple of years ago. I had done those nails a little bit tighter, mm-hmm. and therefore the uh, Danish cord is tighter. So there's you can't see any light through it, which is cool if that's what you're going through. For this one, we spaced it out a little bit more to mm-hmm. three eighths, and there's just a nice little bit of a just a little bit of light that comes through it. I think it's nice because the chair is so heavy so he- that it's having a, a little bit thing. of air between that Danish cord lightens it up a bit. We're basically pretending right now that it was completely totally on purpose. <laughs> uh, it was totally intentional, y'all. It was completely <laughs> intentional. Happy accidents all day long here. Um, so after plenty of hammering and realizing that my forearms are out of shape, we start weaving. And... This was a really satisfying process. The nice thing about the nails is it makes it so that you do not have to pull your entire bunch of cord through every single time. Now that would have been a hard time. Exactly. That would have just been, I've been here for weeks. Um, You basically go through that small gap that I left on either side of the seat in the back, come up underneath, loop around, and pull back through. Mm -hmm. So You just take one loop at a time. One loop at a time. Um, and it's tedious. Mm-hmm. We thought about actually showing you the weaving process today, but we didn't want to bore you all. So if this is something that you'd be interested in learning about, uh, learning more about, or something that you'd be interested in watching us do live, it could be kind of a meditative thing that we could all do together. Yeah. Uh, let us know in the comments. And if we get a lot of interest, then we'll put that video together. Yeah, because it is a cool skill, but it's uh, time consuming. Absolutely. And we do have a lot of content around this chair that we've been taking a lot of time lapses videos. So that too. We'll, we'll scramble something together and I'm excited to share that probably through Instagram. Yeah. All right. So we got the seat done and we did a quick stress test just to make sure that I could handle <laughs> anything that we could throw at it. It holds. <laughs> it holds two engineers. <laughs> If it can handle Sean, it can handle anything. Yeah. Uh, This was to prove that it is definitely on the wide side, but it's okay. It's room for you and a friend. I think you throw two side pillows in there, and it's going to feel really cozy. Absolutely. Um, Yep, there we go. And then we finish the back. Same process. And we're done. Yeah. Wow. So today, we're going to show you how we cut a stretcher. We're going to do a tenon. We're going to do a mortise for the stretcher squared. And then we're going to cut one of these templates, which is what Jake used to outline the curvature of the stretcher to trim on the bandsaw and then finish with what the drum sander, uh, not the drum sander, the spindle sander, Uh, and carefully with the spoke shave. Um, Basically, this is a tall and skinny part, which is even sketchier on that router table. So where before we did the the outline with origin and finish with the router table method, this one was done a little bit more manually, but Jake still made the original template with origin, which was really, really handy. So we're going to cut that today. And you know, for this op, Operation manual was okay because uh, it was more of a feeling thing. We're just trying to get a nice smooth curve, and it doesn't have to be a precision curve because the whole thing was getting covered in cord. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, while we're getting set up here, I want to take this opportunity to remind you, please, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. We'll have a live Q&A at the end of the show for all of our live viewers. Uh, If you're watching this on demand or at a later date, please join us for our next live session where you get the live Q&A at the end of the show. And you also get a giveaway at the end of the show. To enter the giveaway, answer the poll question that's going to pop up at the bottom of your screen. The question today is, where do you buy your router bits? And we're wondering, because we're trying to launch more router bits on our Shaper Accessories store, we've got a couple really cool new ones that we're launching today, a one-inch long-reach, quarter-inch diameter, flat-end router bit, a 
quarter inch diameter, three quarter inch length ball nose router bit, which we used in the late lamp and we used in Jake's snowman trays and the 11 degree tapered ball nose router bit. Those are really a mouthful that we use for the wedge tenons in the trestle bench. You could use them for wedged tenons in Phil Morley's uh, T-Rack. And then you could also use that 11 degree taper to just add a nice angled profile to a tabletop or a desk or any other piece of furniture or fine woodworking that you're working on. It's really got a lot of uses. Yeah. And as we said, uh, more bits will be coming to the store, so we encourage you all to keep checking back in on our store and see what's new. Um, over the coming weeks, uh, I'm going to be using a couple of bits that are coming down the pipeline, mm -hmm. just to kind of tease it a little bit. Um, build some hype. Build some hype. This is like uh, sneaker drop style. Yeah. You know people line up outside the Nike store for those new sneakers? This is just like that, or we hope. If we had a physical shaper store, I know you all would be there. Yeah, for these bits. So what bit are we looking at here, Jake? We're using the 8 millimeter 3 flute upcut. It's a monster. I'll show that up here. And it this is, is really good for tenons, mortises, deep cuts. Uh, the 8 millimeter shank gives you a lot more stiffness. The three flutes gives you a really nice finish quality on yeah. mortises and tenons, gives you that really nice tight glue line. And this cutter, this router bit, is sharper than any other router bit that I have used before. Which Watch is yourself. hard to describe over video. I can't overemphasize how sharp this router bit is. Uh, we got them specially imported for us, and it's absolutely insane. I don't know what they do at the factory to make them this sharp. Yeah, I uh, definitely cut my finger uh, the very first time I opened it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it just, like, surprised me. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm displeased with the stock origin cutters, but we should switch the stock origin cutters to whoever makes this router bit, I think. Right. So should we cut this? Yeah. I'm going to do it in a couple of passes. Um, again, I'm using an 8 millimeter bit, so I'm going to go a little deeper per pass. Um, and let's get into it. Cool. So I've already made my grid. I'm doing a top left grid. i got all my files here, and I believe it is V3. Stretcher tenant, V3. Oh, no. Yeah, you don't want to get the wrong V. I know. I started mixing V2s and V3s, and it got hairy. In my uh, Shaper hub, in my origin files, I make a subfolder for every V. I'm just throwing that out there. That's part of why we do the folder structure. Um, comment with your folder organization structure below and tell us how you do it. I think I did an inch and a quarter. Yeah, that feels right. I'm going to do some math. Let's do 1.25... Divide by three. Bingo. Nice. All um, right, so you're going to do four pocketing passes to clear that out. And by four, I mean three. You're going to do three pocketing passes to clear that out because you just divided the depth by three. And then one finishing pass or two? May do it in two. Okay, just I'm going to try to keep track. So I'm going to step away here so you all don't get the router buzz in my microphone, uh, narrate a little bit, and hopefully we can keep track of what Jake's doing over here. All right, see you in a second. All right, see ya. All right, so you can see Jake plunging here and starting to cut the clearance for this tenon. Uh, one cool thing about this file is that he's made this pocket not inclusive of the tenon itself. So. If you were to make just a rectangle and make that rectangle a pocket, uh, what you might end up doing is accidentally cutting into the tenon itself. Uh, so the shape that Jake's made is a rectangle minus the tenon shape. If you were to look at this file on the computer, um, you would see that it's a hollow rectangle. And that allows you to pocket with the offset both from the outside and from the inside, so that there's no chance of you accidentally running into your tenon uh, and cutting through it. If you get to that point, Origin will automatically retract and save you from yourself there. 
Uh, I think Jake designed these files in Illustrator. We could probably get him to talk a little bit more about that if you asked. If you have any questions about that, please ask in the Q&A. Um, but one cool bit of software that we're working on here is called Shaper Labs. And any Origin user has access to this. It's a lightweight, easy to learn piece of design software that's browser based. So it works on your laptop or your desktop. It even works on your phone. And one of my favorite features there, I think it's called Shape Shifter, maybe Shape Builder. Um, Shape Shifter, Jake's nodding his head for me. Uh, and what you can do there is you can do exactly what Jake's done here. You can draw that rectangle, you can draw that tenon, and then you can subtract the tenon from the rectangle and make this style of pocket, which uh, you wouldn't be able actually to do with our on-tool design uh, capability. We do have pretty strong on-tool design functionality for designing mortises and tenons on origin and even more complex layouts. But this is one of those things where you need a little bit more complicated of a design software to solve. And so if you're interested in making tenons like this where you're roughing out a lot of material and then uh, going in and finishing that tenon, check out that method on uh, labs.shapertools.com. Might be coming up here on a finishing pass pretty soon. And we'll take a look and see how that eight millimeter cutter did. Here we go, we got one more. And as we move into the finishing pass, you'll see that Jake is, unlike the pocket where he could move freely throughout the pocket, Jake is now following the line and Origin is automatically compensating uh, for any offset that Jake introduces into that system. So that tenon's gonna be perfectly sized uh, with the assistance of computer vision. And let's see how it looks. I love that bit. You oh. really chewed right through that. That was incredible. Yeah, I, I probably could have done it, um, my finishing pass, in one fell swoop, but I always like to make sure that... You ended up doing two. I did it in two. Yeah. Because, um, of course, you have that offset that's left over from a pocket, mm -hmm. which is roughly half your bit diameter. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're at full depth, inch and a quarter, that's, that's a, a lot. lot to take off. It's so a lot of force. Split that up a little bit. All right. Um, right on. And it came out wonderful. Yeah. Can we show that off on the Origin Cam once you get that unclamped? I just want to see the surface quality of that 8 millimeter 3 flute finishing cutter. That is a clean tenon. Yeah, buddy. All right. Hopefully I didn't just lose the side that was referenced. I think that's it. I think you got I'm it. I'm going to mark it. Nice. Yeah, don't lose your reference face, guys. Reference faces. Mm-hmm. And what you're going to do now, right, is move that clamping face up so that we can clamp this piece closer to the top of workstation to cut this mortise. Um, one tip or a trick that I found when I was working with Jake's files to prep some of these parts for the show is that since he used the reference pins on workstation to align that tenon, uh, the reference pin and the clamping face of workstation to align that tenon, the way that the files worked out, you can actually reuse that same locating pin to locate this mortise, can. which is really handy. So we don't have to regrid or rescan anything. We can just work with the same scan and file, or same scan and grid, and place the new file exactly at that same zero zero point. Yeah, I'm just going to do an add a scan just so I can see it. Mm -hmm. um, helps me sleep at night if I can see what I'm working on. Fair. But you could technically work blind. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is what he's talking about. I'm actually pressing the shoulder of the tenon over here up against that reference pin. And because my next file is based off of that shoulder, again, happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs> We're good to go. But that's a lesson that we could take forward. When you're, uh, when you're designing a chair with stretchers on stretchers, it's handy to reference the next mortise off of the shoulder of your original tenon. Yep. Or it could be a little feather in your hat for next yeah. time you're designing a chair. Quick note, uh, when you're doing long things on workstation, down here, Goosey, please. Thank you. Uh, and you're running into that handle, this little lock. Oh, you can't see it, but there you go. It's okay to push that up a bit. 
It's more I knew imp- we had that second camera angle for a reason. <laughs> Speaking of happy accidents. It's more important that you are flush with the bottom of your surface than this being fully engaged. It is okay. Nice. Just pushing that all together. Um, and I love these Festool track saw F-style clamps for workstation. Oh, for doing, yeah. They are definitely nice to have. Cool. Boom, boom. All right. We're good to go. I'm going to do an add to, add to scan. Let's see what we got going on. Keeps my grid. Do some quick cleanup down here. Erase that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ditch that. And bring in this guy right here. Inner seat mortise. So I have that little space baked in there. That is my gap that the um, that the cord is going to shoot through. Bingo. And you're ready to go. And, and if go. you wanted to productionize this further, you could name your workspaces so that you could always come back to yep. this file in this place. And I could copy this workspace. So again, kind of minimizing the number of time I have to grid and scan. Because mm -hmm. it's all in the same workspace, same grid. I just copy it and re give it a different name. Yeah, there you go. Okay, well, uh, looks like you're ready to go. I'm going to yeah. step away again. I am ready to go. I'll see you back here shortly. Okay, perfect. There we go. Four steps, four depths, and a four couple depths. of finish cuts. Yeah, because again, we're not going into end grain this time. We're going into side grain. Um, so different forces on the tool. So we're going to take it a little slower. And I also want to make sure that my auto speed is default. Here we go. Yeah, interesting that Jake mentioned here the difference between uh, cutting across or with long grain compared to cutting through end grain. Definitely cutting through end grain on a tenon, you can be a little bit more aggressive because if you think of that grain as a bunch of straws or a bunch of strings, for example, pointing straight up, when you cut a tenon in end grain, you're only really severing those threads at one point at the bottom at the shoulder of your tenon. Here, where Jake's cutting the mortise, uh, both with the long grain and across the grain on the short ends of the mortise, he actually has to cut uh, quite a significantly greater number of threads every little bit that he moves origin. So when you, when you change direction across or with or on the end grain in hardwood, you will feel origin act differently in your hands and it is a at the end of the day a hand tool that you drive so you do have to keep that in mind jake stepped down his depth per pass on this mortise to account for that so he'll have a little bit less resistance as he moves through this mortise but i can imagine that eight millimeter cutter is really helping things it's always good to have a nice sharp cutter uh PSA to keep your cutters clean. We love cleaning our bits here. Gives them a longer life. Make sure you check for any burning. Clean that off. And that keeps your bits sharper longer. I see the spindle off. That's usually the sign. There you go. Couple of things. I definitely braced for a lot because again, in these corners on my finish passes, I'm going up against hard end grain mm -hmm. right in here. And if I'm at full depth, uh, usually in those corners, you feel a lot more than you do on the straightaways. Mm -hmm. But that bit just really handled it well. The bit helps, but it's true. You are, uh, when you're in those corners, you're cutting around much more of the circumference of your cutter as you approach that corner. You could be cutting um, on the edge of the mortise, maybe like 
10 to 15 degrees worth of the 360 degree circumference of the cutter. Whereas when you get into that corner, you're cutting uh, 90 to 100, like more mm -hmm. than 90 degrees around the circumference of that cutter. So it exerts a lot more force when you get into those corners and it can be important to brace yourself, especially in a deep cut with hardwood. Yeah. And we've gotten a couple of comments from our watchers that they want us to talk more about feeds and speeds as we're doing things. Mm -hmm. So quick things to mention. I was running a speed four and a half to five. Mm -hmm. um, I also adjusted my auto speed. You saw that. You may have seen that at the last second um, because I wanted to hold still and just use auto. So I actually bumped it down from my default, which is 10, to 7, which felt a little bit more manageable, again, for those heavy engagement corners when mm -hmm. I'm doing a deep mortise. Very nice. Uh, yeah. And we don't have anything to test fit we today. Don't, but we're, we're cutting a tenon and we're cutting a mortise, and we, Jake, <laughs> I keep saying we, but Jake just finished this chair. So it's a uh, wee thing. We, we have a lot more work to do before we're in the headspace to make more parts for it. Um, so we're working on these stretchers today. We've got a tenon, we've got a mortise. This, for, for reference, I think we didn't even show this off. This is what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. This is a stretcher, an original stretcher, with a tenon and mortise on each side. And then what's this block for? That block is going to get mostly cut away, but that's going to achieve our curve. So it's giving us a little extra thickness where we need it to So this is our curve template down. right here. So we're cutting these tenons and mortises on this original block so that we can keep nice standard reference dimensions for yeah. everything and then gluing on this additional piece of sacrificial almost oak or additional oak um, to use with this template to bandsaw off the top here and then also bandsaw this arch out from underneath. Yeah, that's so, really it. It's a, a lot easier to do all the fine, precise stuff while things are nice and square. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, the curve is just mm -hmm. aesthetic. It doesn't need to be exact. So we mm -hmm. just sanded it to be uniform. Um, yeah. But yeah. Perfect. Not really good. And we clearly already have one of these templates, but we have one more thing that we're really excited about today. Oh, yeah. And I, I, this is just a plywood template. I want it's to just a plywood template. We just got a sample of one of our soon-to-be future new router bits and this is actually not the right one so i hope it's this one here eighth yes. inch yeah this must be it here we go an eighth inch by half inch long o flute router bit and i'm going to reach over and show this off on the origin cam um, you can see here this o flute is uh, o is kind of like shorthand for single flute there's only one flute on this and it's, uh, it comes to a much sharper point than a standard router bit helix. Thank you. I'll hand um, this up to you. With that single flute, you can evacuate far more chips than you can with two flutes, especially two flutes that have a sharper V cut into them. And uh, that makes it really good for plastics and soft non-ferrous metals because one of the hardest things about cutting plastics or soft non-ferrous metals is getting those chips out of the way so that in the case of plastics they don't melt and weld to each other in the case of soft metals so that they don't simply jam into each other so those chips don't bunch up and re-stick to the metal itself metal has a unique property that wood doesn't have wood sawdust won't stick to itself it'll just kind of heat up and burn metal chips can end up sticking to themselves so if you don't get them out of there then that can be a problem so we've got this eighth inch o flute router bit and we're going to make a new template in acrylic hmm. just got a shallow piece of acrylic here to try out to do that i'm going to make a new scan i told you i already scanned that in i'm sorry i lied that's okay But, you know, I don't actually know if we have cut acrylic here in the session studio before. Maybe we've touched on it, but um, 
it can be a very pleasant experience, especially with the right bit. Mm -hmm. We might have touched on it in the materials session. I think we did oh, a materials true. session. Yeah. But we may not have had a... Uh, we definitely didn't have an O-Flute router bit that we are about to sell in our mm -hmm. accessories store. Mm -hmm. So not today, but if you stay tuned in to that accessories store, yes. it'll we're, be there. We're teasing certain things. Go check out the new bits that are already in our store and keep coming back for when we release new router bits. These are totally curated by the team here at Shaper. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter where I place this template. It doesn't need to be referenced to any edge. So I'm not going to grid. I'm just going to freehand place this template here. If I go to cut mode, we're already at an eighth inch diameter cutter. I don't know, Jakey, if you Z-touched already, but in case you didn't, Did, I will. But never trust somebody else's Z-touch. I know, right? Always do it for yourself. There we go. So we're officially Z-touched. I think this acrylic is an eighth of an inch thick, so I'm going to add just a little bit to that. I'm going to go 0.14 deep. Oh, yeah, we've got the calipers here. Quick quick gut check. Yeah, that should be fine. Eighth inch? Maybe do okay. 1.145. 0.145. All right, we'll do it. 0.145. What do you say to no offset on this? Just going for it. Just go for it. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do no offset here. It's a template. We're going to finish sand it by hand anyway. Um, hit it with the spoke shave to make sure that everything's nice and smooth. Uh, so we'll just do this template with no offset. The and stretcher, not the acrylic. The template. The spoke shave. We're not going to hit the acrylic <laughs> with the spoke shave. We're going to hit the final stretcher uh, with the spoke shave and the sander to, to bring everything exactly down to the line that we've drawn. So if this is off by just a skosh, it's okay. We're going to, in the interest of saving time, we'll go straight to zero. Um, speeds, I am not going to mess with, but for the interest of sharing our spindle speeds i'm going to turn this down to three and that's because with plastics you want to be very careful of melting um i haven't used this bit very much in acrylic i trust that it's sharp and it's going to do a good job but typically in plastics i turn that spindle speed down yeah i know i got you with the fake out a couple I of know, times there with walking cutting, away so. from the screen Okay, I'm officially ready to okay, go. I'm gonna walk okay, away. here we go. Jake's going to step away so that he can narrate and so that he doesn't get the spindle buzz. Here we go. Oh, man. Things sound so much differ different down in sp uh, Speed 3 territory. But a nice steady cut with plastic, keeping your feed speed consistent is really key. Um... I know a lot of people too that even will dial in their auto speed and just hold auto the whole time or do auto lock. So it depends on what you're comfortable with. Again, if you're trying to get a really, really uniform edge, it might be best to do an auto lock. What are you experiencing? Pause, because I was getting a little clumpiness. Oh, look at that. You can see this. And it's they're, uh, they're fine chips. They're not welded to themselves. That's actually very good. Uh, but they, were, um, they were making it difficult to move smoothly across the surface. They're slowing you if down. If you were watching the video, you might have seen a little bit of jerkiness. They were slowing me down, and then I'd ride over them. Uh, so that wasn't great. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to step this, uh, I'm going to step my depth back, and I'm going to do this in two passes. Cool. It's important, uh, you know, to not force your way through anything that doesn't seem right. So we'll do 0 0.06. Actually, let's do 0 0.07, and we'll do that twice. Here we go. And this is just a clear acrylic with brown paper, kind of protective screen on it. Uh, another, this, this kind of bit would be great for cutting such things like dye bonds. So you have uh, a plastic 
substrate with an, like a thin aluminum skin on either side. Great for sign making. And of course, non-ferrous metals. Non-ferrous metals being anything like brass, aluminum, copper. No steel, staying away from steel. Anything that sparks, anything that requires lubrication uh, is a no-go with origin. All right, coming back in for that second depth pass. What's nice too about making clear templates is if you have any markings underneath, specifically for alignment, it makes doing that a lot easier. Making it, you can actually see through it. And of course it holds a nice crisp edge versus MDF or plywood. Right. I know it's not a great thing to smell, but I do kind of love the smell of acrylic. I couldn't even smell it. Yeah. Did you smell it? Yeah. It's got it's got a very distinct smell. A little bit. Uh, I was impressed by how little, and by little I mean not at all, this melted. Mm -hmm. Nice sharp cutter really does some yeah. magic. All right, peel this up. You got it? Cool. Yep, I got it. There we go. Now that is a template. Love it. Peel this sticky paper off. We tend to leave this on when we're cutting with Origin because it leaves Definitely. a nice, provides a nice substrate for your domino tape and for your double-sided tape and everything. And keeps your Origin from Scratching it up as you're yeah, scooping across from it. from scratching it up. If for some reason you got some acrylic uh, that doesn't have that on there, put some blue tape down. Um, do something over the top of it to protect yeah. it. Now nice. Let's show off this edge quality here. I hope you can see that. It's uh, nothing like a good clean cut in acrylic, and that's what that sharp O flute cutter is going to do for you more so than a. Uh, than a two flute cutter because with that single flute geometry you can just put a sharper tip on the edge of that flute that's really all that it is it's the sharpest available geometry for a cutter helix yeah uh, and so with this that subtle curve we can pop that down on top of our stretcher there we go now there's that overhead if you can oh, see oh yeah it. the acrylic template is so much better than it's the plywood super template super clean Make sure that these are lined up. This is what I really care about. Hold it down. And mark it out. There we go. Move my big head. Love it. Ready for the bandsaw. Nice. All right, well. I would say we're about ready to move into Q&A, yeah? I think so. Okay, so uh, you saw today the finale, the wrap-up of Jake's chair. Uh, if you missed any of the introductory material, go back and check it out on Instagram. We've got a couple Instagram Lives that we filmed over the last month and a half. Uh, go back and watch the start of this session if you're tuning in late where we did a tour of all the features of Jake's chair, showed off some cool stuff, Danish cord, uh, curved stretchers, some crazy mortise and tenons and lap joints. And uh, what are you making next, Jake? Thinking about making a nesting coffee table. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Although tune into that. Everyone that's also sat in the chair thus far immediately sticks their legs up and they go, where's the ottoman? Yeah. Most people at the office are smaller than you and me. <laughs> so so they, certain people's so legs can't, feet can't reach the floor. I think I need to make an ottoman for it too. Okay. But that might be a side, okay. side, side gig. 
All right, everyone. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure.